look, uh, Jonathan, man, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on with me. Um, super excited to have you on, uh, you know, Olympic athlete, all that. Um, so I want, I want to dive right into this right off the bat here, man. Um, first of all, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Um, dude, you were, you, you look, you were, you were one of the very first people I ever thought of once I, once I figured out I could do this zoom, <laughs> these, these, uh, shows via zoom with, with people like you, you were one of the very first people that I ever thought of. Um, and, uh, cause I think you can add a great insight to, to all this with, you know, you've got the Olympics starting tomorrow. Um, obviously you're an Olympic athlete, uh, you know, decorated athlete, you know, what's, what's your thoughts on, on, uh, you know, what, what, you know, like based on your experience and everything like that at the Olympics, what are, what are these athletes that are there for the first time? What are they, what are they experiencing right now? Um, well, I am lucky enough to, I'm still somewhat involved in the sport. Um, I'm actually on the board. I'm one of the, one of four athlete reps for the team. Um, so I'm, I'm still somewhat connected. And then obviously a lot of my teammates, um, are still skating. So I follow them on social media and I can interact with them a little bit, see how they're doing. Um, yeah, I, I, this, this group of athletes, um, uh, not just for the U S but, um, the athletes that are all the athletes that are keep competing in, in China, um, <clears throat> my hat goes off to them. Um, these last couple years with, uh, with COVID has been, you know, just really crazy. Uh, it's really changed the landscape of how, competitions are run, uh, obviously testing. Um, I truly believe if I was still skating, I would be a complete mental case right now. Um, I, I just tip my hat to these athletes being able to, you know, show up every day, you know, having to get tested, uh, you know, every day just to see if you have COVID, not even like drug testing or anything like that, um, like, like normal, but it's just uh, the mental fortitude that these athletes have right now is just I, I, I just, like I said, I tip my hat to them. So i um, super proud of everybody. And uh, yeah, it's just kind of, it's a, it's definitely a crazy time. Um, I actually feel a little bit better for the athletes that are making it for the first time because they don't really know any different. Um, I'm sure it's going to be kind of tough for the athletes that have been to an Olympics before because they know what a regular Olympics is like um, with, you know, obviously having fans, you know, I've been watching through social media you know, even the cafeteria, the athlete cafeteria, um, all the tables are sectioned off. They're like kind of in cubicles to try to uh, mitigate what's going on, um, which in some ways, obviously I understand, but for me, it, it's tough because um, I just remember all the moments and memories that I have from walking into that cafeteria and the camaraderie between the different countries and sports that you've never seen before. Um, and making friends. That's kind of what the Olympics is all about is, is bringing everybody together. And um, uh, it's, it's just kind of tough to see, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad they're at least able to live out their dreams and, and still compete. Uh, you know, the core part of the Olympics is still there for sure. But yeah, what these athletes are going through right now is, uh, is pretty crazy. And I just, I commend them so much. Uh, I, I, I truly don't believe I could do it mentally. I think I would have kind of lost my I would have lost my marbles if I had to do some of this stuff so these guys are amazing like on the training side do they are is as everybody required on a daily basis to get tested during training um I actually don't know what it's like right now as far as in the U.S. um I I probably should um but I'm sure I know they're they're very closely monitoring all the athletes um and I know a lot of them were getting tested anyway because the way it works, how you qualify for the Olympics is there's four world cups, uh, prior to the Olympics that season. So they start like second week of November and they run to roughly the second week of December. And based off those four world cups, your country earns spots for the games. So throughout those world cups, they've had to have been tested every day just to be at the world cups. Um, I know personally, I was a little let down because the last, sorry, the world cup three was here in Salt Lake. And, um, I knew it was going to be the last time that me and a lot of my, especially my international friends were all in the same place. And even me knowing everybody and, you know, knowing the staff at the oval, I, I wasn't able to have any access to some of my friends that are still competing because of 
COVID restrictions, which I totally understand and respect, but it was tough because I couldn't really get to say goodbye to a lot of the people that I wouldn't probably ever see again, um, that I competed with for year after year after year. And, um, I know some of my Canadian friends that I'm really close with, you know, normally when they come into town, they're here, you know, I'll take them out to dinner, um, kind of show them the best of what Utah has to offer. But with the COVID restrictions right now, like I couldn't, I couldn't see any of those guys. So, um, it was, it was tough, but, um, you know, their, their health and safety for me is way more important than any of that. I'm sure, you know, the people I'm the closest with, I'll, I'll make trips to Canada. I'll make trips to Norway, wherever I have to go to, to hang out with those guys. But it was kind of a little bit of letdown for me, um, not being able to interact with my friends like that. But that being said, it was just awesome to see everybody skate at such a high level. Um, especially the U S that was the weekend. The U S, um, set the world record in the team pursuit skating unreal uh joey skating amazing Brittany skating amazing aaron skating amazing so that was amazing to see I'm, I'm glad i got to see that but yeah not not being able to interact and uh see my friends was tough because i was really looking forward to it um i was really looking forward to seeing everybody and i, I mean i did get to see them race but there was no you know one-on-one -on -one interaction or anything like that so yeah. yeah that's a bummer uh yeah yeah like you said when you're you're getting to hang out with these people for years on end and then it's ramping up to you know the biggest time the biggest stage of you know of of all time for for a lot of these athletes and you don't you don't really get to sit down with them and and have that interaction that really sucks yeah and especially for the olympics um it's roughly a 50 percent turnover so fifth, half the athletes that are there regardless of sport country gender this will be their only olympics they, they won't go to another one. This is all they'll ever get to experience. Um, and for me, that's tough because uh, I, I don't think they're getting the full Olympic experience. I mean, they'll obviously be Olympians for sure. There's no question about their, their talent and their work ethic and their determination and dedication. There's, there's no question about that, but um, it might sound silly, but um, the, com the camaraderie and uh, just the experience is, is so much better than, you know, any type of, um, physical accomplishment at the games. You know, I, you know, I, I never medaled at the Olympics, so, um, I'm just kind of, you know, living vicariously through the people that have, and, you know, every, when you, when you ask the Olympians, like, what's their best moment, it's almost never, oh, winning a gold. It's always like, oh, meeting this person or walking into opening ceremonies or being able to hug my family after my event or look up in the stands during my event and see my family. Um, cause those are, those are things that'll never go away. If you set a world record at, or an Olympic record at the games, most likely in a matter of time, it'll, it'll be broken, but those memories will never go away. Um, and I know it sounds silly cause the Olympics is so competitive and not saying I wasn't there to compete, but, um, it's, there's just so much more than performance at the games. Um, it's just, it's such a special time, you know, two and a half weeks every four years. And it's just, it's magic. Um, you know, you watch it on TV. I watched so 94, 98, 2002, 2006, all on TV and 2010, sorry, before I went. And as magical as it looks on TV, it's 10 times better in person. Like it's, I, like I don't have any words to describe it. Um, so yeah, I, it's, it's tough, but. So, so you were, in, you were in the 2014 games, correct? 14 and 18. Yeah. 14. The last um, what events, what events did you, uh, did you, did you qualify for? I skated, I was supposed to skate the 500 and the thousand in, uh, 14, but I got disqualified at trials in the 500 on a technicality. So I only skated a thousand, which I was happy about because that was my best race. Um, and then in 18, I skated the 500. Um, the team was just both, I mean, both years for the thousand, uh, we had six guys in the top 15 in the world in the thousand. Um, and you can only send four or three, three now. Um, so unfortunately I was fourth at trials in 2018. So I didn't get to skate the thousand. I only skated the 500. Um, but those are the two, two events that I was best at, but I was a lot better at the thousand than I was the 500. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, we've, we've known each other since, uh, I mean, you were, you were a little kid. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was eight or nine when I was looking up to you guys, you know, you Chad and forth, like, especially in that, that Houston realm, like, yeah, you guys were like, you guys were rock stars to me. Yeah. When I was a little kid. I was like, man, these guys are so good. Um, 
and I will be, I'll, I will be honest. Like I kind of, kind of looked up a little bit more to, to chat and forth because when I was coming up, it had nothing to do with ability. Um, when I was coming up, I was more of a distance skater. I ended up becoming a sprinter and you were a sprinter. So I kind of looked up more to ch uh, chat and forth because that's kind of what I was, I was doing, but yeah, you got you three guys. I remember like skating for champions. I was like, man, maybe one day I'll get to skate for champions and I can <laughs> be as good as these guys are. Well, yeah. And you know, that's, that's what I was going to say. It's, it was, it was funny. I, I do know that you skated uh, the sprints once you, once you got to ice yeah. and you did, you were more of a long track uh, or a long distance skater when you were doing inline. Mm -hmm, 100%. What? Joey Cheek was kind of the same way. Not saying I'm Joey Cheek, but uh, he yeah. was a distance guy and now he's a two time Olympic gold medal or two time Olympic medals and a gold medalist in the 500. So, yeah. Yeah. Which that was a, for, uh, you know, for me, that was a huge, that was a huge surprise seeing Joey Cheeks um, yeah. do that because he was, he was a longer distance guy and then all of a sudden goes to ice and he just, just dominates that sprint yeah he's um, in, the, in torino he was just i mean if you go back and look at the times like he decimated second place this russian guy's uh dimitri law or what was his name i can't, can't remember his name um he's coaching now this russian guy but he destroyed second place like it wasn't even close he was the only guy in the 34s everybody else was skating 35s like he, and he did it twice because back then you did two 500s yeah. one in one outer and combine the times and he was the only guy to go sub 35. He just like, it was so cool to watch. And he did it on, on aluminum blades, which even at the time, everybody was skating on steel and they still are. Everybody's still skating on steel, uh, steel tube blades. And he did it on like aluminums, which is just crazy. So for him to do that is just, I mean, he was amazing skater. Don't get me wrong, but even still to do that, what he was doing was just, I mean, he, it wasn't even close. Do you think like, do you think it has to do with the transition from inline to ice that, I mean, obviously like when Chad transitioned, he still did longer distances. Um, Joey Mantia uh, still does longer distances. Um, do you think it was, it was, it's had something to do with the transition from inline to ice that that someone like you and Joey Cheeks ended up specializing in the sprints? I guess I never really thought about it, but I guess so. I mean, I remember not that I was a very, I was pretty small uh, on inline. I was never a big guy, but I do remember I had, I had trouble putting power down on inline. Like I would push, if I push really hard, like I would slip, the wheels would just slip away from me. Um, and when you get to ice, you're in the surface. So you never, if your blades are sharp, you never really have to worry about slipping in a sense. Like as long as you're on a good edge, um, so I think maybe once I got to ice, I could kind of like not worry about having to slip and I could just put as much power down as I could, which is super important for sprinting. Um, but I've never really thought about that, I, I guess. Um, and then like that second, that second, uh, Olympics that Chad went to, I mean, he was still more of a distance guy, but he meddled in the thousand, like he got third. Um, so he kind of made that, that switch too. um. Yeah, I can't, I, I wish I had a better uh, reasoning for that, but I, I guess it's just kind of dependent on who you are. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Cause even when I was on short track before, I mean, I skated on the national team for short track for five years, world cup uh, championships, um, skated a pretty high level there. Um, I was still a distance guy. I would, you know, the first time I, I won a race at us championships was the three K um, which is the longest race. Um, on, on, on short track. So it wasn't really until I got to long track that I actually became uh, more of a sprinter. And, you know, as, uh, as our coaches tell you or tell people, you know, you never, you never pick the race, the race picks you. Like I wasn't, I didn't, when I come, when I came over to long track, I wasn't like, Oh, I'm going to be good at a thousand or I'm going to be good at 15. I, you know, I tried, I thought the 15 would probably be my best race and I was okay, but I was, I was much more of a top end speed guy. Um, when I was in short track, I got, I got blocked a lot. Um, and I had a hard time with people like getting in my way. So I could never, or not never, but unless I was in front, I had a hard time getting to top speed because of traffic and in long track, you don't have to worry about any of that. You know, you wide open throttle, no restrictor plates, 
like just go as fast as you want. You have your own lane. And um, I think maybe that had a big part to do with it. Um, but yeah, I can't really nail down like one thing of like why I was a distance skater when I was uh, on inline and why I was a sprinter. I mean, because on inline, my two best world championships in 06 and 07, you know, I was skating the 10K points alum and then the alum, the 15K alum. Those are my best races. So I couldn't, I couldn't tell you. So you got, you obviously, uh, uh, opening ceremonies are tomorrow. Um, and they just, uh, I guess, announced today that Brittany Bow is going to be the honorary flag carrier. Mm -hmm. um she's i guess she's holding the flag in place of someone else uh, i don't remember the the individual's name who was i guess slated to be carrying britney's gonna end up carrying it mm -hmm. um you were there for two opening ceremonies obviously i've seen pictures of you and stuff like that you were there with like jessica smith and mm -hmm. uh people like that um like like describe that like what's like what they're like what they're about to go like this the opening ceremonies like what's that like so for me personally um it's definitely my favorite olympic moment um it's my favorite olympic memory um and it was definitely sochi just because it was my first one um but yeah it was just it was un it, like the energy it's just like i i can't even describe it so um i don't really know how the russian alphabet worked but it was pretty similar to the american alphabet so we were pretty far down and so they normally come out alphabetical order by country name um so in sochi it was this open outdoor or it was indoor sorry it was in, it was an indoor venue it felt outdoor because it was very cold um but it was covered and uh we started outside and you kind of like weaved your way back and forth uh, through like the back hallways and corridors of this arena and you couldn't really see anything in front of you because of so many like winding back and forth switchbacks and every like I mean it felt like an hour it was probably more like 45 minutes from when we started outside the building as a team um, walking in but every corner you made you could kind of hear the crowd because the crowd in Sochi was just going crazy in, in the stands and Every time we turned a corner, we we're like, oh, this is it. This is it. So we were kind of getting amped and uh, we turned the corner and we had like 10 more to go or 15 more to go, whatever. So by the time we actually got into the arena, it was just like, um, I mean, I obviously I wasn't there. This was way before my time, but I just, it felt like you were a gladiator, right? And you're coming out and the crowd is going nuts and you just have all this adrenaline. And um, I was really fortunate to be surrounded by uh, really good friends and teammates, um, some new, some old, you know, the, the way Sochi worked is I became really good friends with the bobsled team because me and one of the bobsledders shared a very similar interest and in, we had the same favorite band. We we're both big Pearl Jam guys. Um, and I actually, I actually saw him. So he was in Vancouver, won a gold with the bobsled team in Vancouver. And I just happened to go to the, this one standalone show with my brother in Kansas city he just happened to go to his marketing guy got him in touch with the band and he actually played the last song of the set with his gold medal around his neck from vancouver this was like may of 2010 so this is like three months after he won and i just I, so i went to every pearl jam show with my brother because me and my brother are big pearl jam guys and i just like looked over to my brother i'm like is this real like my two favorite things like pearl jam and the olympics are like together so four years later he makes this team for bobsled again and i meet him i'm like hey i was at the show in kansas city and before i could even say my name or give him a handshake he just gave me the biggest hug and this guy played line at uh the university of nebraska i was gonna say he's probably huge he's massive <laughs> he makes you look small <laughs> he's huge and his name's kurt we we're still really good friends but anyway they were at the front and kurt was like hey jonathan come up here like we'll we'll basically like lock arms and nobody will pass us and you're so short that we won't even know you're in front of us. So me and my speed skating friends and now my new bobsled friends are front row walking into opening ceremonies with, you know, 150 Team USA people behind me. And like, it's just, and Jordan was there with me, you know, Jordan Malone, uh, he was right there with me. He became good friends with those guys too. One of the bobsledders was from Texas. So there was only three Texas Olympians 
in Sochi, Jordan being one, me being one, and then uh, Justin Olson was on the four-man bobsled team. And you just make these friendships. And, you know, I've, I've known Jordan since we were like eight and yeah. we're walking in his opening ceremonies together. Like, like I'm, I'm holding back emotion right now, trying not to get emotional about it. And this is eight years ago. And it was just, I mean, I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, it was just, it was one of the best moments of my entire life. And uh, it's just such an honor to walk in with, you know, with USA on your back and representing your country and being there with people that you've, you've gone through a lot of stuff with um, good, good times, bad times, the, the hard stuff. And it's just, um, it's, it's something you just can't put into words and it's something that'll be with you for the rest of your life. It'll, it'll never go away, you know? So um, yeah, opening ceremonies for me, at least my, in the Olympic village moment, and I've had some pretty good ones. Um, that one just takes the cake. It's just, you know, I, I don't think I've, it's funny. I, um, I just moved and I'm, was going through some of my things and I found my camera, which has the hard drive or the, the SIM card and opening ceremonies is on that. So I walked in to, to Sochi. So if you see any pictures of me in Sochi or video, I'm holding the camera the entire time. Like mm -hmm. I'm walking in and I have the camera. I've never watched that footage. I don't know if I could like watch it. I'd probably freak out if I saw that. So I, but I do still have it. I just found it a couple of days ago before I moved. So um, yeah, it's just, I, I know I'm rambling, but it's just, it's so hard to put into words how amazing that feeling was. No, it's gotta be great, man. But um, well, look, you're still, I mean, you're still involved in the sport. Like you said, you're, 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 you're on the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm one of the athlete reps. So um, anytime there's an issue or, even if there's not an issue, you know, I just, I'm there to represent the athletes to the board. And, uh, I just do my best to keep their, their best interest, uh, in mind. That's, that's what I'm there for. I'm completely selfless. Like I, I have no, I have no bias in that sense because I'm not competing anymore, but, um, I do, I do obviously know what it's like to be an athlete. And I feel like when I was an athlete, some things were kind of looked over and maybe not thought about. So I try to bring those issues to the forefront. So the board understands, what it's like to be an athlete with the pressures of the Olympics or world championships, whatever it is, just to make sure that they have what they need uh, to compete the, at the highest level. So you guys um, obviously, obviously now with, with COVID and all the different restrictions and everything else, have you guys, are, are they doing different things for the athletes today than like what they did with you guys, like through sports psychology, are they spending more time with the athletes just mentally preparing for what they're going to be dealing with and all the additional, I mean, it's, it's already tough enough to go out there and skate. Now you add in all the, 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 all the other bullshit that everybody's got to go through. Yeah. Um, are you guys are, have, are they putting more out there, more resources out there for the athletes? Yeah, hundred percent. So it's, it's kind of funny. All of this stuff kind of works in quads. Okay. So every four years, um, the kind of the USOC makes the U S Olympic committee makes this, uh, this itinerary for the next four years, whatever it is. Um, so I know for my first quad, so 2010 through 14, that first quad I was in, um, that was all about high performance. Like that was kind of the big thing we worked on. It's like, how can we train at the best? How can we train the smartest? How can we work the hardest and most efficient at training, which was really good. I learned a lot from that, um, kind of more of sports science side of, side of things. And then in that second quad from um, 14 to 18, the big push was recovery. So we kind of learned how to train hard in that first quad. And now it was all about getting the best sleep, making sure that you were able to come to practice the next day after a hard day and be able to repeat that effort. Because if you you know, went hard one day and you weren't able to recover and it took a long time to get to that, that, to that level of practice again or training, it's just not efficient. Being able to repeat it throughout the week as many times as possible is obviously the most effective way of training. And then I really noticed this, this last quad, they really did focus a little bit more on the mindset, men mental side of things. Not that they didn't before, but I feel like that was kind of a bigger thing um, this time around. And like I said, like I said earlier, it's, you know, what these athletes have gone through uh, mentally, you know, I mean, I mean, two years ago, they didn't even know if there was going to be an Olympics, you know, I mean, how do you, I mean, I can't imagine training for two years and then, you know, all this COVID stuff happens and they're like, oh yeah, may not even have an Olympics. 
Mm. Like, you know, it's hard enough. I mean, speed skating and just like anything else in life, there's no guarantees, but to not even like not be guaranteed based off of your effort, like put that aside, just no, no guarantees that the games are even going to happen. Not that you may not make it, but yeah, I mean, I don't know how these guys have done it. And, uh, you know, I just tip my hat. They are so amazing. Um, not that normal Olympians aren't, but I feel like these athletes at these games are just next level, just, you know, Navy SEAL type mindsets, just, I mean, you, you can't survive now without being able just to be super mentally tough and just letting stuff roll off your back. You know, you, you have to, well, what, what kind of, what kind of resources like, I mean, uh, you know, I talked about this the other day on my shows that, um, you know, God forbid something happens there in, in Beijing where, you know, there's a, a, a spike in cases or something like that. And, people start getting, you know, they, they, they start delaying things. They start, uh, you know, possibly, uh, you know, what, what happens to an athlete, for example, if they have to, um, you know, say they test positive and, and they have to quarantine are, I'm assuming they're, 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 they're not allowed to skate that event. Um, I'm, I don't know the exact, uh, process of that happening, but I know things are extremely strict and stringent. Um, I think um, the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, is doing a really good job of making sure um, that inside the Olympic Village, you know, just to get in is really hard. Um, so I think that takes a, a big weight off a lot of people, people's shoulders, especially the athletes about, okay, like, how cautious do I have to be inside the village? Um, I think it's pretty safe and everything that I've seen through social media, through, you know, my friends, you know, direct access from what they're, you know, they're living every day there. It seems really safe. Um, but obviously I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I don't claim to be. So, um, I, I know how crazy this, this, um, Omicron is kind of spreading. Um, I had COVID three weeks ago. I had no idea I had it. Um, didn't really have any symptoms. It was just, I had, well, I had symptoms for about five hours and that was about it, but I can speak to one of the athletes, um, on the U S team that just qualified for long track. He is leaving today. I believe, um, the rest of the team left almost a week ago, but he had a positive COVID test and the IOC and the Chinese government would not let him on a plane until I think he had to have three negative PCR tests. And he finally just got those PCR tests, I think yesterday, the day before. So um, yeah, and I'm gutted for him. It's his first Olympic team. Um, he totally missed team processing in LA, which is uh, where you get all your gear um, and you get to experience that with the team. That was another one of my favorite memories of like just going in and Nike and Ralph Lauren giving you all this stuff and custom tailoring your opening ceremonies gear. Um, that's a fun thing to do with your team. and. Uh, you know, unfortunately, this athlete will never, well, at least for this game, so I'm sure he'll make another game because he's extremely talented and very young, but um, he didn't get to experience that, you know, and he now he's flying over by himself. You know, Delta was um, is the partner of Team USA. I don't really know how it's going to work with him because I think all the Olympic athletes are already there. Um, so I don't know if he's flying commercial or what, but Delta flew a big, like large amounts of teams from the U S from LA after team processing straight to Beijing. So like he won't have those memories. So I'm still glad he's able to compete. Um, I think he'll get there right before our opening ceremony starts. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just a really weird time. And, um, I feel in some ways I kind of feel weird about, um, I don't really feel like I'm, I'm complaining about it. I'm not trying to say I'm complaining about it, but I do feel bad for the athletes. And the reason I don't like complaining about it is I don't personally have a uh, blueprint or a template of how to make things better. So unless I have an idea of how to make things better and I'm pretty confident in it, I try not to complain too much because what's, I mean, I don't really feel like I'm doing any good doing that. Um, I just feel like I'm being negative, but yeah, it's just, it's just a weird time. And it's, I, I feel weird talking about it. Not like I don't want to talk about it. It's just, I don't really know what's right or wrong. I feel like what's up is down, what's down is up. And 
hopefully this passes, you know, I'm just trying to stay as optimistic as possible. And um, I try not to say too much about like, oh, you know, their experience is going to be different um, because I want them to have a good time. I don't want them to be like, oh, well, Garcia is saying it's not the same. And it's not, it's not what I'm trying to say. I just want to get the Olympics back to, you know, what I experienced. I want people to experience what I experienced because these kids these days are working just as hard, if not harder and smarter than I did. And they deserve that, um, in my opinion. So I just, I don't know how to give it to them. Um, that's way above my pay grade. So um, I just want things to kind of get back to normal. How that happens, I, I, I don't know, but. So now, I mean, now you're doing, um, you're actually doing coaching yourself. Yes. Um, you're doing it with a, with a hockey player or are you guys, is that, are y'all still together on that? Yeah, hundred percent. So um, I'm actually at his house now. We're actually moving to Wisconsin together. Um, yeah, so I started power skating or what they call power skating, what, what hockey players call power skating. Um, I actually started coaching the last summer. I was still competing. Uh, I had a friend here in, uh, in Utah ask me if I could help her son. And I looked at her and I was like, uh, I don't really, I've, I've played hockey. I have wear hockey skates. I know how to skate on hockey skates, but I told her, I was like, look, I, I don't really know how to teach like hockey players to get better. And she's like, Oh, I'm sure you'll be great. So I, I helped him out. And, um, you know, I worked with him three or four times, just really basic stuff. And he, he kind of got, he got better pretty quick. And, um, we're just kind of started traveling in the hockey community here in Utah, uh, which is a pretty small community. And that's kind of how I got into it. I was never planning um, on doing that. I didn't even know it was a thing. Um, and then a few months later, I met my buddy, Jack Skilly, who um, I, I work with, and he's going to be my my boss here in Wisconsin in, in, in about five weeks. Um, he played 12 years in the NHL. Um, he was actually small, a small world. He, when he was playing for the Blackhawks, he was the seventh overall draft pick for the Blackhawks in 05. Um, when he was playing for the Blackhawks, the Blackhawks were actually employing Dan Jansen, the speed skater, who I started skating because of. That's the first time I saw speed skating in 94. So before I even roller skated any of that, he was the first person I saw. They had Dan Jansen as their power skating coach for the Chicago Blackhawks. So when me and Jack met here in Utah, he's like, wait, you're a speed skater. You know, Dan Jansen, you know how to do this on hockey. He's like, dude, you're my guy. Like, let's stick together. And we've been working together. It'll be three years this summer that we've been working together. Um, just signed a contract with this hockey academy in, in Wisconsin called Valley Sports Academy. Um, Jack will be the director of hockey. Um, I'm going to be the power skating coach and one of the strength and conditioning coaches for off-ice training there. So um, I'm still in skating in one form or another. Um, I love it. It's, it's awesome. I don't, you know, I wear, this is what I wear to work you know, so, uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty fun. Like my, my, my wardrobe for the last 13 years when I was a speed skater versus now my work has not changed. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun and it's, it's just different enough, um, from speed skating, uh, to kind of give me some confidence, um, not in a bad way, but I was kind of proving to myself that I wasn't just a speed skater. I could do more than that. Um, so that's been really good for me in that sense, uh, as much as I love skating, I didn't want to just be like only a speed skater. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I kind of needed to prove to myself that I could do other things. I didn't have to just do speed skating. So did, um, cause I know there was a program along with the, um, I guess U S speed skating part of the, I don't know if it went through IOC, but there was a, there was a program where you guys could go get, uh, uh college degrees from, from Utah. Yeah, it's actually still going. Um, I actually got a large part of my college tuition paid for. Um, I not through the University of Utah, but through the community college, which is also a sponsor of uh, US speed skating as well. Um, that really helped a lot. I mean, I, I there for two and a half years, roughly two years. Um, that helped a lot. And yeah, half, I mean, uh, Casey Dawson, the Park City kid, uh, who, who made this last Olympic team. I know he's part of it. I think like half the athletes on the national team right now 
and half the athletes that are on the Olympic team right now are part of that U- U- uh, University of Utah program. I know Mame Biney, the short tracker, she's probably the most popular one. She's a Red Bull athlete. Um, she's part of that. She's loved it. I know Kristen Santos, uh, another short tracker on this Olympic team. She's been part of that Utah Olympic uh, or Utah University or U- University of Utah uh, program, which has been really good. Um, it was something that I didn't really look into until later um, in my career, probably like the last year or two years, I was actually on the national team. Um, I'm kind of a very one track minded person. I don't like to multitask. I mean, I do when I have to, um, I just felt like, um, I didn't want any regrets, uh, in the sense of, I knew that I'd always be able to go to school whether I had to get loans or, you know, pay myself, I always knew that school was going to be there. Um, I just didn't want to devote too much time to school while I was an athlete. Um, and then look back on it and be like, man, I, I could have been a little bit better at skating if I didn't have this. Um, and that was kind of the way things were when I was an athlete in the kind of the generation before me for the most part. And now these kids are superhuman, you know, these younger kids, these kids that are, five, 10 years younger than me, they're just like, oh yeah, we took three, four classes this semester, went to the world cups, won gold medals. They're just like, it's, 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 um, it's really awesome to see. And, you know, I'm, I'm super proud just to say that I know these, these, these athletes and they're so amazing. I I feel like I'm really glad I was uh, the age I was when I was, because I feel like if I was skating now, I don't know if I'd be able to compete with these guys. These guys are next level and it's great to see you always want the next generation to be better than you right so um it's just amazing to see how well-rounded these athletes are not just in sport but socially and then also um academically as well so these kids are smart and uh it's it's awesome to see was uh was was ryan shibakuru was he your was he your coach as well so I had two two national team coaches throughout my two quads. Ryan was my first coach on long track, and dude, he's he's my favorite. Uh, I still talk with Ryan. I actually just messaged him a couple of days ago. Yeah. Um, I probably learned um, more from him once I got on the ice than anybody else. He was he was a big supporter of me, and uh, I was pretty hard headed at sometimes being an inliner. You know, it's like, well, I want to do this and especially having people like Chad come before me, which is a good and bad thing. Uh, It's good in the sense that Chad was very like, I'm going to do it my way. And luckily he was talented enough to do that. I'm not as talented as Chad. So I kind of had to conform a little bit more to ice than he did. Um, And even though I was really hard headed, Ryan was always in my corner. Like he never, he never shied away from me. He never, you know, gave me less attention. He never, he, he's just like one of the best, uh, best people I've ever worked with. And he's one of my biggest inspirations as a coach now that I'm coaching that I try to draw upon. So him and Chris Tidwell, those are the, my two, um, I would not be where I am today without those two people. Those guys really, uh, molded me into who I am today. Uh, especially my mindset more than anything, structure, uh, accountability, responsibility, all that stuff really stems from those two people uh but yeah ryan was was there um my first quad um definitely would never been half as good as i was without ryan and then my second quad i had matt corman also another fantastic coach i talked with him quite a bit um he's just got such a great sports science mind um he's super educated and he i learned a lot from him because he was kind of i wouldn't say he's the opposite of ryan but ryan i feel like is more on the art form of speed skating the technical side not that ryan isn't super smart sport science wise but um they're kind of like yin and yang Uh, you know ryan's kind of like the the technical art form part of speed skating and matt was like this like sign like sport science wizard so it was nice to have both of them because i learned a lot from both and now it's paying massive dividends for me and my company um in my, my career. So I learned a lot from those two guys. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, I've had, I've had, Ryan's been great. Um, I met him back in, um, 2001 when I, when I had moved over to ice, well, 2000 moved over to ice, 2000, 2001 season. 
um, met him um, and they had just, they were just about to open the Olympic oval. And so I, I had an opportunity to move from Canada to come down and um, skate with the national team. Um, but I just, I didn't want to skate anymore. So, uh, but Ryan has always been great. Um, he even, even to this day, we're still friends on Facebook, Instagram, and anytime I've reached out, had questions about certain things, he's always been there to answer them. And, and he, he feels like he's the, um, he's got the feeling like he just, he, he knows in his bones what it means to skate and it just transitions. It kind of feels like it just comes out of him. Yeah. When you, when you talk to him. Yeah. Um, I think the, the biggest thing I can say about Ryan is I don't think you'll ever meet a better person regardless of skating knowledge coaching he's just like he's probably the most selfless person I've ever met like he would literally give you the shirt off his back like that's just that's Ryan like he's just um I really hope we have more coaches like Ryan I don't know how much longer Ryan's going to be coaching hopefully I, I hope for the athletes coming I hope another quad but um yeah he he's taught me so much not just with skating, but just as a person, like, um, yeah, he's just, he's amazing. I, I'll always be close to that guy. Um, he probably wants to go out and spend the rest of his life wakeboarding. Yeah. So that's kind <laughs> of where we have, we have our, we have our tussle because Ryan loves wakeboarding and wakeboarding's great, but I'm more of a wake surfer. Uh, he kind of looks down upon the wake surfers <laughs> so when i like send him stuff about me wake surfing and stuff he's like oh that's one way to live your life <laughs> yeah where do you where do you like to go out there when you go do you um i mean do you, you do you have a boat or do you go out with with friends oh, so i have some really good friends who i actually met through ryan so my very first client um their son was uh or their son plays hockey but the parents uh, Jason and Kristen, they're really good friends with Ryan from boating. And that's kind of how another part of like my career started. He was the Aiden was my first client and I've gotten really close with them. Um, during COVID, I spent both Chris or Christmas and Thanksgiving last year with them. And then I spent Thanksgiving with them this year, this past Thanksgiving. Um, they're kind of like my second family. Um, but yeah, as far as wake surfing and wakeboarding out here, there's so many places. There's quite a few, quite a bit of reservoirs. Yeah. Um, there's one right next to park city. Um, and then obviously Lake Powell is like one of the great places to go. Um, I was fortunate enough to go with Lake Powell, um, September of 2021. That was like one of the best we camped for six days and we just wake surfed and wakeboarded all day. It was like one of the best, best trips I've ever been on. Um, but yeah, there's the Jordan L that's right next to park city. Um, yeah. there's so many places to go. So, but I'm excited because my buddy, Jack, he has a friend that has a boat in Wisconsin and there's tons of lakes up there. So yeah, I don't think my wake surfing days are over. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I remember, uh, remember I came out there in, in, uh, August of 2019 and we spent, mm -hmm. uh, we spent a day together. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was, I remember it was, it was funny because, anytime you saw a truck like here in texas obviously everybody has trucks yeah um so you know they're they're ubiquitous they're just everywhere there obviously most people are having you know like they're uh, like suvs and, and all-wheel drive cars things like that um but anytime you would see a truck you would see there was a boat being pulled behind it yeah it was like it it truly was the 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 trucks were like they had the purpose there rather than what everybody i mean you know moms buy them here just to yeah. go get groceries yeah so yeah boating's boating's pretty big in utah um utah is just much more of an outdoor state not that texas isn't but um there's something to do year round here so when it's brutally hot and oppressive in houston in the summertime i mean yeah it still gets hot here but it's still nice enough where you can go and do things outside um it's just, it's a little different. I mean, I remember the first, I think I lived here for three years before the first time I came back in the summer. So I, I come back every Christmas and Thanksgiving, which where it's not super hot in Houston. And I remember that first summer, I, I was like, was, has it always been this hot? And my parents were like, yeah. And I'm just like, can we start the car like 10 minutes early before we get in like cool off? And I just like, I, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, adapted to it anymore. And I, I, it was, I was just like, okay, I guess it's just how it's always been, but yeah, it's uh Utah's a little bit more 
mild uh, in the summertime because it's so dry here yeah. and it never really gets too, too cold. I mean, there's a handful of days it's in the single digits. Most of the time it's like twenties and forties and sunny in the winter time. So it's not too bad. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of outdoor stuff to do here. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it. Yeah. We're going to be, uh, we're actually going to be in park city, uh, yeah. the end of the end of this month Yeah, for, uh, for Dustin Garcia's bachelor party. Yeah. Um, there's about 12 of us coming we we were, we got a house um there in park city yeah i already um, told everybody on main street you guys are coming so yeah <laughs> yeah we it's it, but it's fun though man we um like uh like like fred me fred and dustin we all bought these um called uh snow feet and um they're basically just like miniature skis uh but they're like the size of skates they're eight they're 16 inches okay is is how big and they just strap on pretty much strap on to your 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 snow boots um and you just hit the slopes and you could just like you're like you're skating um so we all bought those we're all going to come down there but um hoping hoping that when we get there there's plenty of snow on the ground dude hasn't um, snowed in months the last day it snowed was i think new year's eve or new year's day something like that it's been a while and it's crazy because i i was in houston for for christmas and I got back and it snowed like 15 inches a day for like three days, like the last few days of 2021. And I was just like, okay, I guess this is what kind of season it's going to be. And then 2020 hit and like, it, it snowed a little bit last night. We probably got like an inch here, but um, there's enough man-made snow, at least on the, at the resorts, like, and it's been cold enough that it hasn't really melted. When you get here, you'll, you'll, you'll see like on the sidewalks next to the sidewalks. I mean, there's snow up to your waist. Like there's still, even though it hasn't snowed in a while, there's still a lot of snow. So, yeah. Well, you know, we're here, here, um, in Houston, it's, uh, well in Texas overall right now, uh, we've got a, we got a front coming through and they're, they're calling for, you know, uh, we're going to be down in the teens, yeah. um, in like San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, um, tomorrow night. Uh, and with, with, it's supposed to have started raining and then it's going to snow, it's supposed to snow here. Um, hopefully, I mean, for my business, I hope that, that we have, we have a similar, <laughs> similar to what, what happened last year with all the, with all the freeze with the pipes and everything. But, uh, um, I hope it doesn't get too bad, but it, yeah, I hope not it's going to get pretty nasty. We're supposed to be pretty nasty here too, but, um, yeah. I remember last year when that happened, I had so many people in Texas and, you know, family. I was like, what do we do? I'm like, uh, well, you need to have a good coat. And most of them didn't. I was like, well, there's yeah. your first problem. you're going to be cold. You know, yeah. you're prepared for it. It would be like if it flooded here, you know, right? People, people just wouldn't be able to, I mean, it's just not meant to have that type of environment here. So, yeah. Um, some, uh, <laughs> some I want to talk to you about because I'm, I'm into the same, pretty much the same thing you are, but I don't think nearly is, um off the freaking deep end as you are is uh shoes i was hoping you're gonna say sneakers <laughs> <laughs> dude how many how many freaking pairs of shoes do you have uh i haven't really counted um i that's the last thing i have to move over to this place um is my shoes so when my when my buddy jack came over the last week his first time he'd like been in my closet and he's just like Dude, like, I think you need therapy. <laughs> um, I, if I had to guess, I'm probably somewhere like 80s or 90s, like pairs, something like that. It's slowed down a lot. Um, I haven't really bought too many. I, I think last year I only bought, you know, three or four. Um, but I follow all these like sneaker people on Instagram and stuff. And the thing that sucks about shoes is that they don't last forever. Even if you take care of them, like the EVA, the foam in the shoe yeah. will just disintegrate. Like it, even if you don't wear them like oh, 15, 20 years, it'll just turn into dust. And it's like, it's pretty, for me, it's disheartening. It's like, man, you know, I, I, they're definitely not investments because I don't sell, I don't sell sneakers. I only buy sneakers to wear, but it's kind of like disheartening to kind of, spend that money and then knowing one day that they won't be there um so i've really gotten really big into watches the last couple of years <laughs> that's kind of where i've been 
putting my <laughs> my money because those will last you your entire life. Um, yeah. But yeah, I I still love sneakers. That's something that'll never never go away. Um, yeah, I, I I love sneakers. It's cool. I mean, we grew up. I think a big part of it was you know I consider us the same generation. Yeah, we kind of grew up in a golden age where marketing and athletes really took off. I mean, in the eighties, you just didn't have the same type of marketing that you had in the nineties with, you know, you just had all these athletes like Bo Jackson and Michael Jordan and Penny Hardaway. And you had all these athletes that had their own brand and, you know, Jason Kidd, you just had all these athletes, you know, Shaq, Charles Barkley, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Ken Griffey Jr. Um, And my parents were awesome. And I definitely never went without, but they were also like, all right, you know, one pair every year, one pair every six months. And like, there was such a plethora of shoes. Yeah. I couldn't get everything. And like, now I can buy all of them. So I'm kind of like reliving my childhood through the shoes that I never had. Not that I was, my parents were awesome. And like I said, they did more, they did more for me than I ever needed, but um, they were also very responsible and knew that I didn't need a crazy amount of shoes but now that i'm in charge of my life i can buy the ones <laughs> you could be completely irresponsible exactly so <laughs> or are you i mean I, like i saw you had a pair of they look like uh they were like baby blue air force ones or something like that oh they're uh they're jordan ones they're jordan close. ones yeah okay those are, those are probably in the top of my rotation right now i love those things now like shoes like that you wear them all the time like do you or yeah. i mean obviously with the snow and stuff like that outside you're, you're very careful with them but i am cautious but i am 100 percent a, a believer in wearing your shoes like that's what they're meant for yeah. um again i'm so heartbroken maybe that's a little aggressive but i'm so heartbroken for all these people that like never wear them and they just keep them in their closet and they open the box one day and like the whole midsole, the EVA and all the foam is just crumbled. It's like, dude, you never even got to like wear them. You, <laughs> like, why do you like, why do you have them? They're not, for me, they're not a paperweight. They're, they're meant, they're, they're shoes. At the end of the day, they're sneakers. They were designed to be worn. And yeah. um, there's a lot of kids, you know, I coach some hockey kids now and they're kind of getting into sneakers and a couple of them walk into practice and they walk real stiff like it. So they don't put any creases in them. And I'm just like, what are you doing? Yeah. I was going to ask, are you one of those guys that, that like, you won't like, like you refuse to make sure you make sure that you never get a crease in the toe or anything like that? No, no, no. I, I mean, I, I, I try to take care of my stuff. Don't get me wrong, but I'm not going to like change my body mechanics to like not put creases in my shoes. (laughs) That doesn't sound enjoyable. Like what's enjoyable is putting on a pair of shoes that you really like and living your life, not changing anything and having the shoes that you like on and just I think you just have to come to terms with, you know, they're not going to last forever and they're meant to be worn. So you might as well enjoy them. I mean, I I think that's life, right? Yeah. Well, I watched watched a video the the other day of a guy, I guess he had a, a, some said something like $20,000 limited edition Jordan ones or something like that. And he wore them to on the day he was proposing to his, uh you know fiance (laughs) and when before he got down uh, on a knee he took his damn shoe off he took one shoe off so it wouldn't crease it way to ruin the moment bud (laughs) yeah i was like i was like i was like seriously are you like (laughs) it was so it was an absurd thing but i will say this um and i do i think about you specifically every time i go into my closet and i see these i've got i actually have a pair of um god they were the i'm not sure if they're the jordan 11 or jordan 13s they um the patent leather all around them 11s yeah so i was in i was in seventh and eighth grade when those came out and my parents were not going to buy me those shoes they refused they refused to buy well when i was actually living in canada train uh speed skating training for the olympics there I came across a store. They reissued them in 2000. Yep. And I got a limited edition pair of the gray on gray. Yeah. The cool grays, man. Those yeah. are awesome. So I actually have those in my uh, closet. They're sitting on the shelf. They don't, they're not in a box or anything. I've actually worn them twice. Uh, both times I was in Canada. Um, yeah. I, I bought them. I wore them twice when I was there and I've never worn them again. Um. 
I actually, I pull them down every once in a while just to check on them, wipe the dust off and stuff like that. Um, so I can, I can appreciate like, but I don't have like 40 pairs of shoes that I won't wear. I probably, I think I counted in my closet. I think I have just over a hundred pairs of shoes, Yeah, which is, it's, 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 it's a mental illness. It's a, it's yeah. a problem, but I literally wear them. Like, yeah. um, like I'm big into Adidas, um, love, love Adidas. And I got a ton of the, um, the NMDs and the four D's. Yeah, um, this is kind of hard to beat. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I was into the Ultra Boost for a while. Um, kind of, a, I got a funny story about an Ultra about about my Ultra Boost. I have like, I think I have eight pairs of Ultra Boosts, and um, but uh, the NMDs, they 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 the the ult, I have wide feet, and the NMDs yeah. are they just fit my feet better. Yeah. Um, kind of kind of funny short story about the Ultra Boost. Apparently, um. <laughs> So I went to Colorado back in September to watch Texas A&M play Colorado. Um, and Colorado is sponsored by Nike and uh, Texas A&M is sponsored by Adidas. I happen to have on a pair of Adidas um, that, and, and they weren't, they weren't like, anyway, we're leaving the stadium. Colorado was beat. And there's, uh, there's this kid and he's pissed off. He's probably 19 years old and he's drunk and he's very angry and he starts making comments. And I was upset because he was talking shit about my shoes. <laughs> and so, and he was like, it, it, and he was just, he just started mouthing off about, Oh, we got these assholes walking around here with these ultra boosts on. And like, I had to stop, I stopped dead in my tracks and I had, I'm like, I walk over and I'm like, Hey man, look, um, first off these are nmds all right know your shit okay get it get it right um and then we ended up getting into it. we got into my face and i ended up throwing him like 15 feet um it probably wasn't the nicest thing to do but um anyway apparently he did not like adidas um so are you one of those guys do you are you are you like uh like strictly like do you predominantly go towards like Nike, like Air Force One, uh, Nike ones, uh, Jordan ones, stuff like that. Or, I am definitely more of a Nike guy, but I do appreciate the Adidas, and I have, I have Adidas. I have three or four pairs of Ultra Boosts. I have one pair of NMDs. Um, my friend Matt Welty, he actually does a, a lot of stuff for Complex Sneakers. He he works out in Man in New York. Um, he's a big Adidas guy, and he loves Specials. Like that's his thing. I like he influenced me enough to get a pair. I love those. Um, but I would say I'm more brand loyal to Nike. Um, and going back to your, your Jordan 11s, that, that is kind of a lot of people's grail shoe because that really changed, um, sneaker culture in the sense that kind of before, not so much, but that was kind of the major turning point. There was a few shoes before that, that were kind of in that same direction. But what I mean by sneaker culture is, so that shoe was designed by Tinker Hatfield and Jordan, Michael Jordan told him, he's like, Hey, I want a shoe that I can wear in a game that looks amazing, but I also want it to look amazing with the tux. <laughs> that was the design theory behind that shoe. Yeah. So that was really when sneakers went from on court to streetwear. And funny that you mentioned that shoe, because I can tell you the first time that I saw that shoe. I was in third grade, maybe second grade. And I, my, my parents worked until like five every day. So I was in this after school, like kind of like um, just like program, just like a daycare kind of thing at my school. And we would go into the gym at the school after school was over. And I walked in and the PE teacher, her son, his name's Travis Hollingsworth. I'll never forget this. Her name was Mrs. Hollingsworth. I can't remember her first name. Um, she was my PE teacher and Travis was on, he was in junior high or high school. He was junior high or high school. He was on their basketball team. So he would come most days and he would shoot baskets in the elementary school because that's where his mom worked. And I remember walking into that gym on at Wolf Elementary and seeing those Jordan 11s. He had the original colorway, which was the, the, the black patent leather with the white upper. So mm -hmm. it was the Concord colorway, the black and white ones. And I just remember going like, what 
are those i was like those are so cool <laughs> um but yeah I, I think i'm a big nike guy be, because of jordan he's my favorite athlete of all time um i was a pretty big lance fan he was a nike guy bo jackson um a lot of it has to do with marketing um so and then another thing that really kind of put the nail in the coffin for the nike stuff for me was they are the official team supplier for the olympic team at least the teams that i was on in 14 and 18 and um i'm really big into details so i know when something is just kind of phoned in and they just like slap an american flag or the olympic rings on something and it's just like something that they sell it not that there's anything wrong with this but something they sell at academy or dick sporting goods that isn't specific to the olympics right mm -hmm. and you go to team processing and nike only gives you like specific things for the games like you can tell that everything was designed by their best designers and it's strictly tailored for the olympics so they don't hold anything back like everything that you get is like on the inside it says home of the free or land of the free home of the brave or just like these little details that you wouldn't get anywhere else so for them to have you know supported me at my two biggest events of my entire life as far as sports I think that really just kind of hit the like the nail the nail in the coffin for me um but i i love sneaker culture more than anything so if you're a new balance guy or an adidas girl or a reebok person like i love the culture itself i don't really care if you like what i like it's the fact that sneakers kind of like the olympics will bring people together i don't care if it's something i don't like it's the it's the respect for the culture more than anything. So, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll actually, I, I, I really enjoy it myself. Just, I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm not, I don't have any of the original boxes or anything like that, but you know, I go to the gym every single day and I make sure to like, I always pick, like, I'll go pick the, 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 the shorts and the shirt that I'm going to wear to the gym that day. And they don't necessarily match but I always go and pick a pair of shoes that kind of color coordinates more or less with the clothes that I'm wearing. Yeah. Um, and I'll wear, you know, I'm, uh, like I said, it got like, like, you know, got like close to a hundred pairs of shoes. So it kind of, it can get kind of ridiculous, but I'll go to the gym and um, you'll see, you'll see people in there, you know, power lifters, they're just wearing chucks, you know, stuff like that. But then you'll see some other people in there. They've got, you know, some, some really badass sneakers and I'll walk up and I'm like, man, where'd you get those ones? You know, oh, this is, you know, this one's from here and all that stuff. And it, and it, it, it is, it's pretty neat culture where, where people can vibe and kind of get come together just on a pair of shoes. hundred percent. That's, that's what it's all about. Like, yeah, I, I, like I said, I don't really care what you wear, but I can respect like, okay, this person is taking time to, you know, seek these out or, um, obviously like in order to get these shoes you really need to be like a sneaker person and know where to go or what time they release mm -hmm. and to me that's the most important thing i don't really care what what brand it is or anything like that it's just like kind of like that camaraderie um it's like when i see somebody wearing like an olympic shirt it's like oh you like the olympics too it's like they could be a completely different background have completely different political views have completely different religious views and none of that matters like it's just Hey, you like something that I like, so let's be friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, look, man, I know, I know. You told me you got a you got a meeting coming up. Um, you got a board meeting you got to attend here. Um, so, man, I just will, you know, we can we'll end it here, man. But I want to say thank you. Um, well, let me let me back that up. Um, I don't think that I've ever told you how proud I am of you. Um, knowing you from such a young age, um, and at one point in early 2000, when I was helping coach, uh, with Tracy there in, in Cy Fair and everything, um, you know, you've grown into, well, not only, not only an amazing, you, you also obviously became an amazing athlete, uh, and you, but you grew into a very, a very good man hey look we may not we may not be uh completely politically aligned on a lot of stuff <laughs> we may not have all the same opinions on stuff but um i don't think i've told you this man but i'm 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 very proud of who you have become and uh and and who you've been uh what you represent and uh man i just i i, 
I just really wanted to, to, to express that from the bottom of my heart, man. I think you've become a really great human being. Well, thanks, man. Really, like, serious. That means a lot to me, um, especially, like I said, growing up, uh, looking up to you guys. Like, and again, you're, you're a part of my journey. You know, so like you're, you're, you're a part of me, you're a part of what I became. Um, so, I mean, I, I wouldn't be here if I didn't have people like you and forth and Chad to look up to when I was, I was a kid because, um, you know, the Olympics is something that's, especially in Texas is a very distant kind of foreign thing. And um, when you don't have those people like you and forth and Chad kind of in that close proximity, you know, obviously I never skated for champions, but being at Derry Ashford, um, you know, like, I don't think if I didn't see that carrot, you guys being the carrot to, to chase, I don't, I don't know if this would ever happen. Um, it, I, you know, people always ask me, they're like, well, what's the key to success or how did you get to where you got? And, um, I tell them the same thing. I tell my athletes the same thing. It's all about who you surround yourself with. For me personally, I can't really speak for anybody else, but I am a totally a product of my environment. And I have been extremely fortunate from the day I started, even to today with the people that I, and I, and now I'm a little bit more selective. Like I tried to put pe like good people in my life. When I was a kid, I didn't have, I didn't know who to be around. You know, I didn't have that mindset of, oh, you need to make sure you hang out with it. I just fell into it. I fell into hanging out with people like you and Jordan and Chris Tidwell and got me to Utah. And then I started being around people like Ryan and all these other amazing people I am a hundred percent a product of my environment. And I know that if I'm not hanging out with good people, I'm not going to be my best self. I, I need those people in my life to help guide me. And you're a hundred percent part of that. You know, it really does take a village. You know, I didn't do any of this on my own. Um, the amount of people I, I could thank right now, or I couldn't even, I don't, there's not enough time in the day to do that. So, but just know that like you are a huge part of that. So don't, don't, don't discredit that at all. So. Well, you know, I know I probably wasn't always the nicest person. I mean, I was a bit of an, I, I say this all the time. I, I openly acknowledge the fact that when I was younger, I was an asshole. I was a bit of a shithead um, to pretty much everyone and, you know, around me, but. Um, Same. I was a product of my environment. <laughs> look, we were, let's be honest. We were both spoiled little shitheads. We were. Yeah. I mean, no it's, <laughs> it's just the way it was, man. But, um, but yeah, Jonathan, man, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank you for all the, for sharing your journey with us. Uh, let us know what's going on out there, man. Um, man, and best of luck, dude. I can't, well, hopefully maybe, maybe, uh, if you're around, maybe we, you get to come hang out. We're, uh, yeah, uh, I got to see you guys for sure. At least for one night. So yeah. Cause it's, we'll, make uh, it happen. well, Fred, Fred was over here today. He says, hello. Yeah. Um, you mean fourth. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, everybody else knows him as fourth. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, Dustin uh, told Dustin that I was going to be talking to you. He says hello as well. And yeah, everybody says, we can't wait to see you. Um, uh, Steli, uh, he's, he, he's going to try to meet up with us one day while we're out there as well. Um, mm -hmm. So hopefully we can all get together and, and uh, enjoy, enjoy a drink together. Go see uh, one of the bars on main street. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I'm sure we'll go, go to more than one. So yeah, just a few. <laughs> Well, Jonathan, man, thank you so much. Appreciate everything, man. Best of luck um, on your future endeavors, man. Thank you for everything you do with Team USA. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Sounds good, man. All right. Bye.